In your testimony, you said, Dr. Babcock, and I quote, unless we have a return to 40 or $50 a barrel crude oil, we can expect the price of corn to be well above historical levels for the foreseeable future, even if all support for corn ethanol were eliminated, end quote. So as policymakers, this puts us at an interesting position because it, it that itself argues for the development of alternative fuels, um, not per, or based on corn, but, uh, but a significant number of which will be based on commodities, raw materials, which, uh, which would also presumably have an impact, impact on commodity prices. Um, so how do we decide here? Well, um, with high price gasoline, the world, the markets are demanding um, and hoping for alternative fuels. Um, we know how to produce ethanol from sugarcane and from corn, and so right. that's what the that's what we would do. Um, uh, so I think that if we don't want the the impacts of converting of taking land that can be grown used to grown food and use it to to grow fuel, then we need alternatives to food based. Um, uh, transportation fuels, and so the 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 uh, the investments that DOE is making in trying to figure out how to make waste products into transportation fuels, how to take corn residue, uh, yeah. wheat uh, residues, um, maybe some um, uh, uh, perennial grasses that could be grown on land that isn't suitable for growing food crops, um, jatropha that can be grown on degraded lands. All of those alternatives are giving a are being given a huge boost by the the, the price of gasoline, but they're also um, could could stand for some public uh, investment in. Um, in uh, just figuring out how to do it. And so DOE's uh, uh, pilot programs and their investment in uh, research centers, I think, is the right path. I, I cannot resist thank you, saying at this point that the uh, climate change bill that Senator Warner and I and many others will put before the Senate in June also has an enormous flow of revenue that derives from the sale of credits but will be reinvested in uh, uh, technologies <laughs> such as the ones you're talking about. Um, my time is coming to a close, but uh, Reverend Beckman, I was real interested that you uh, went to uh, essentially um, uh, global, not just American, but American and other uh, national programs of essentially protectionism is the word we use, but price supports for agriculture that you would say are, are also a significant contributing factor in the increase in world uh, food prices and therefore the increase in hunger. Do you want to s talk any more about sure. that? <clears throat> sure. Uh it just seems to me it's clear that we need a, an economically efficient, responsive, <coughs> dynamic agriculture. And the U.S. and Europe and Japan all have highly protected agricultures. The developing countries have recently put these export restrictions on food, which have made the immediate problem worse. Um, so I assume uh, they did it because of the price increases. Yeah, one by they, they one. wanted to. Well, hold, they're afraid. So, hold, like hold. India put uh, right. export restrictions on cheap rice because right. that's what ordinary people people yeah. eat. And so, but lots of countries have done that, and it's made the the problem worse. Uh, so, to have a, a more dynamic, responsive agriculture just seems that's going to bring down food prices uh, in the medium term. And in particular, as uh, Dr. Rosecrans said, it's agriculture in poor countries that's the hope in this crisis. Um, because there are about 100 million people, as you said, who have been really very poor people who've been adversely affected. But there are about 600 million people who are equally poor who are making their living in agriculture. So if, if um, I'm really delighted that the President's supplemental um, request for 09 includes not just food aid, but local purchase for food aid and agricultural development through AID. Because if we invest in the agricultural productivity of very poor people around the world, they can help to bring down food prices for the 100 million, but do it in a way that will raise their own livelihood so that you'll get permanent progress against hunger. Thanks. Appreciate it. Senator Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Siegel, I had a good time visiting your retail store yesterday in York, 
and seeing firsthand the enormous variety of breads that you produce, I want to make sure that my colleague from New Hampshire knows that you sell in New Hampshire <laughs> as well. And uh, I'm sure he he'll be interested in, and is interested in your testimony also. It's really important that you came today because you're helping us understand the actual impact on a small business. I'd like to go over with you some of the facts of your business because I'm not sure that, um, that it was as clear in your quick testimony as it was when we were talking yesterday. So first, why don't you tell us how many employees you have? Uh, we have about 50 employees right now. So you have 50 employees, and am I correct that you use some 50,000 pounds of flour a week? 50,000 pounds of flour a week, yes. And tell us how much you spent for that amount of flour back last September. Uh, last September, a uh, truckload of flour was uh, $7,600 a truckload. $7,600. And in February, you reached the high point so far. And what did you pay in February? We actually bought in before the peak. We paid $22,000 a truckload. $22,000. So your costs in just a matter of months have gone from $7,600 for the ingredient that you use the most of to $22,000, is that correct? That's correct. And what has been the impact on your business in terms of pay raises for your employees or plans to expand? Have, has this enormous increase in your costs changed some of your plans for your business? Well, what it's done is um, there, the employees aren't getting any pay raises right at the moment. Um, what it, you know, we're, we're a small business, so for me, um, I've always had a comfort level in knowing what we could, it would cost to make the bread and, you know, what it costs to sell the bread. Um, the prices increasing has basically put a big unknown factor in there because we don't know if they're gonna keep increasing. Now the prices have come down from their peak of $28,000 a truckload down to, um, I think today is probably 15. Um, for me, being a baker, you know, we didn't know if, if when it went to, to 22 and then to 28, it could have gone to 38 or 40. At, one, at, some, at some point in time, um, it was just out of control. So what has happened with our business is that it's actually we've taken kind of a different stance. We figure the only way to combat, uh, we, we don't have control over the prices, so we raise the prices. Um, we do have a lot of customers that um, aren't buying the bread anymore. But um, we're trying to grow our sales. We're just trying to increase, because we think that increased sales is the way to combat um, increased costs. And so we're just kind of winging it. We're going, we're trying to expand, and uh, we're gonna <coughs> hope that this will solve the problem. Thank you. And I think uh, that testimony is very compelling because it shows the impact not just on your business, but the 50 people who work for you, whom you're not able to give pay raises to because your raw ingredients have increased. And that, in turn, has a ripple effect on their ability to purchase a new car, for example, or uh, to buy more food for themselves. I think that's an important point. I want to go to uh, Dr. Rose Grant and talk to you a little bit about the federal policy. As Dr. Babcock has pointed out, we're really talking about three policies on, on ethanol, the subsidies, the mandates, and the tariffs. And it seems to me that the combined result of those policies has been to distort the market so that food is no longer being used for food. Food instead is being used in increasing proportions for fuel. <clears throat> now there's an alternative, and that is cellulosic ethanol that doesn't use food. It uses wood chips or fiber or the corn stalks rather than the corn itself. 
should our policies be revised so that instead of having this enormous subsidy restrictive tariffs and high mandates for corn based ethanol should we instead be revising those policies to encourage the development of cellulosic ethanol y yes I, I would support a shift in, in priorities along those lines that uh, as Dr. Babcock said, even if you reduce the subsidies and, and remove uh, import tariffs uh, now, that the, the U.S. corn-based ethanol uh, industry would not collapse. It would still produce significant amounts, but in that case it would be uh, competing in a sense on a, on a level playing field with other, uh, other uh, sources and other parts of the corn industry. So I, I think a movement away from those and a reinvestment of the, of the savings, particularly, for example, the subsidies, and into other types of, of, of ethanol could have long-term benefits. So it is worth noting that even optimistic estimates would say that this uh, truly commercial cellulosic ethanol is probably two to five years away, and pessimists say 10 years. So I, I think with additional science-based funding that that, that 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 lag could be shortened and, and, the, and the two to five year period could come into play. So I, I think greater investment in those fields, I think, could have uh, much stronger long-term pay payoffs. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I know my time has expired. An issue that we haven't discussed is the cost to the taxpayers of these policies as well, and whether that money could be more profitably invested uh, elsewhere, but I have a feeling that perhaps my colleague from Oklahoma may get into that, <laughs> that issue. Good question. Thank uh, you, Mr. Chairman. I have that same feeling. Uh, thanks, Senator Collins. Senator Carper is next to be followed by Senator Sununu. Thanks. Uh, and uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Collins, thank you very much for, uh, for holding this hearing. This is a wonderful panel and uh, illuminating, timely, enlightening, and uh, we're grateful for, you, for your testimony. I mentioned uh, uh, earlier uh, today uh, while we're doing uh, some of our colleagues were doing opening statements. I mentioned to those of my colleagues who just arrived uh, some uh, some uh, news that I, I heard uh, earlier this week that uh, GM has uh, taken, a, I think, an equity position in a couple of firms that are involved in in uh, producing uh, 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 biofuels uh, in a maybe a more cost effective uh, more cost effective way. And uh, I uh, we're going to submit for the record some press reports about this. But I just want to share with uh, with my colleagues and those that are gathered some some of what I've. Uh, uh, learn uh, the investments uh, uh, by uh, uh, producing ethanol by uh, GM and its uh, its partners suggest there might be ways to to make the biofuels work without uh, having the adverse uh, uh, unintended consequences with respect to the environment and with respect to uh, to food to security and food prices. The the company one of the companies that I think GM is uh, has partnered with is a company called Coscato C O S K A T A. And uh, Cascada apparently has developed technology to make cellulose, cellulose uh, make uh, ethanol from uh, a lot of different uh, wide range of, 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 of products, including garbage, uh, including uh, automobile tires that are stacking up in our, uh, our states across the country, uh, plant waste, uh, among others. We're told by uh, the folks at Cascada that uh, its uh, design uh, produces ethanol for uh, less than a buck a gallon and uses less than a gallon of water for a gallon of, of ethanol. And... Uh, they're not going to have the. Uh, uh, they're going to have their first commercial uh, uh, plant up and running by uh, 2011. They'll make anywhere from 50 to 100 million uh, uh, gallons of ethanol, which is not a huge amount of ethanol in, in terms of our, our overall demand. But the reason why I bring it up is, is to suggest that the uh, free enterprise system, the marketplace, and technology can help us uh, to address and to uh, to provide some good solutions to the the challenges that we face uh, to, to today. And I'm encouraged by 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 that, and I hope hope that we are too. Uh, in terms of, uh, of the use of uh, better use and better targeting uh, federal dollars, uh, the idea of actually putting tech, uh, federal dollars into that kind of technology and encouraging that technology makes a lot more sense to me and maybe it does to you as well. Uh, my colleagues uh, in, uh, in our delegation, Delaware's delegation, uh, worked to get an $18 million Energy Department research grant about four years ago to go into work going on at DuPont Experimental Station in Wilmington. That money has uh, led to the creation of a, uh, a fairly large pilot operation, pilot plant now in someplace in Iowa. Uh, with a major partner that is uh, uh, going to take, hopefully, get us to uh, a full scale uh, biobutanol, not biobutanol, full scale cellulosic ethanol production uh, in a few few years, not five 
or 10 years, but, but hopefully sooner than that. And also at, uh, over at DuPont, they've been working on something called biobutanol, working on it with BP. There's actually a pilot uh, operation, a commercial operation, selling a product now in, in Great Britain. And uh, biobutanol has better energy density than ethanol. Biobutanol uh, apparently travels in pipelines. Ethanol does not. Biobutanol mixes better with uh, gasoline. Than, than traditional ethanol. So there are solutions on, on the way, and my hope is that what we'll do is be smart enough to figure out how to, to put our uh, scarce uh, uh, federal tax dollars into uh, nurturing those kind of, of technologies. Now, let me. here's my question. That was a, a long statement, but here's a question. I do have a question here. Uh, Dr. Babcock, you and, and Dr. Rosegrand talked, uh, I, as I recall, about uh, uh, the effect share with us some numbers about the effect, numbers effect on corn prices and, and, and ethanol and so forth. But you, you talked about eliminating the blender tax credit, eliminating the import tariff, eliminating the ethanol mandate. And, and I think you both had numbers to share with us as the consequences of doing that. Just explain again what you said. Where you're, It sounds like you're pretty close together. But uh, just, just say, it, say it to us again, please. Consequences of eliminating the blender tax credit, the import tariff, eliminating the ethanol mandate. What, what are the consequences? Okay, my, my testimony price? is that if you eliminated all three of them, that it would uh, drop the price of corn by about 80 cents a bushel. It would increase the price of gasoline by about 4 cents um, a gallon um, because the ethanol supply would drop. So there's a trade-off there. Um, if you eliminate them piecemeal, the effects are much lower. So if you just get rid of the blender's credit, then the, then the RFS kicks in. If you get rid of the RFS, the, the blender's credit keeps things operating at capacity. So maximum in the, and I'm, I'm thinking short run of 80 cents. All right. And, and Dr. Rosegren, my, my recollection is that Senator you're... Senator Carper, no. could I just interrupt on that point? I think it's important that you get the percentage of the increase because the 80 cents sounds, sounds like very small what, what is to it? us. 13 percent. 13 percent, yeah. That's, yeah. I just wanted to clarify right, that thank point. You. Thank sure, sure, Dr. Rosegren. Yeah, the, I think the, the closest analysis that we did to uh, what Dr. Babcock said is that was if we... We didn't look explicitly at the separate items, but what would happen if, the, if you uh, uh, did a set of policies that would leave uh, corn-based uh, bioethanol production at, at its levels in 2007, which I think is pretty much what would happen if, if you Im implemented these. There might be a slight decline. And we ended up with an immediate uh, decline of about 6% in, in corn prices, but a 14% uh, decline by 2015 as it works through the system. So, in fact, it was quite remarkably uh, similar, given the very different kinds of models that we're using. Mm. Uh, your, your advice to us in terms of policy advice, and you, one of my colleagues may have asked you, uh, put this question to you before, but let me just ask it again. Your advice to us, into what, what should we do with, those, uh, on those, uh, with respect to those three policies? The, the blender tax credit, the import tariff, uh, eliminating the ethanol mandate. What should we do? Okay. Let me just ask everybody, everybody, just for Mr. Siegel, just take it down the line. Your advice to us? I, I actually I can't answer that question. Thank you very much, Dr. Babcock. Um, it depends what you want to accomplish, but you're going to get very limited impact if you do it piecemeal. Now, what I want to do is to uh, uh, reduce our dependence on foreign oil. I, uh, frankly, I'd like to be able to somehow uh, supplement to farm income to make uh, make farmers less likely to want to sell their land to, to developers and to maintain some of our open space and to, to try to find a way to, where biofuels can actually reduce our dependence on foreign oil and supplement farm income to some uh, extent without to, to just turning a ec economics and supply and demand on its, on its head. Uh, uh, Reverend, Reverend Beckman? Well, I found this really instructive. I think you, a 13 percent in decrease in the price of corn is not going to depress rural America. And um, there are other things that you can do through farm and rural development policy that would do a lot more good for rural America. So I'd get rid of all three. All right. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rosegren. I mean, I, I think I would be cautious about flipping all three off immediately. It's in, it's in this kind of uh, uh, often on signals is, is yeah, difficult in the industry, but a I, I think a phase down of all three would be an appropriate policy. And 15% isn't a lot, but it, it's enough to br uh, bring some starving children out of hunger in, in, in developing countries. And it's not going to solve the food crisis, but it's a contributor to it. Well, I, th I think what one of you said, uh, if, we, if we dratch it down the blender tax credit from what is it right now, 51 cents to take it down to 46 cents over the next couple of years, that doesn't do much at all. I think uh, everybody agrees on, on that. All right. A very, very uh, helpful uh, hearing. Thank you very, very much for for holding us today. Uh, thanks very much, Senator Carper. Uh, Senator Sununu and then um, Senator Coburn, of those who are here. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, 
I want to take most of my time to make a few comments, so I may not have a lot of questions. I think the panelists have already addressed a lot of the important points, but I do think there are a couple of things we haven't touched on. First, I definitely want to take the time to welcome Mr. Siegel. I know he's got operations in New Hampshire, also Massachusetts, I believe. Uh, I'm glad to see it's a, a growing a small business and well aware of the operation because I read Senator Collins' news clips every day. And so I saw a wonderful article, not just about uh, her visit, but about the great work you're doing. Uh, at the bakery. Uh, a couple of the panelists made the comment, well, uh, well, we have to recognize that the ethanol industry won't collapse if all of these subsidies are taken away. And, and I think that, frankly, misses the point entirely. Because this isn't a discussion about wanting to make the ethanol industry collapse. This is a, dis a discussion about stopping bad policy that has significant economic consequences, significant environmental consequences and uh, moral implications in dealing with the food crisis around the world. It's not a question of uh, you're trying to make the ethanol industry collapse. It's a question of uh, what kind of an impact do these policies have. And I, I frankly, I think they are universally bad. And I think we need to be a little bit more candid about that impact. It was suggested by a couple of the, the panelists, well, it we really wouldn't make sense to, to cut back just a little bit. It wouldn't support a reduction, uh, just a small reduction in one of these programs because the Im impact wouldn't be that great. By that reasoning, the way to impose bad policy on America is to create 50 different programs that each impose just a little bit of damage on our economy, just a little bit of damage on consumers and that you'd never be able to justify rolling any, any of them back because rolling any one of them back really would only help a little bit. Okay? We need to be sincere and honest that these policies are damaging. They are increasing prices, corn prices, but they're also increasing prices of all the other crops that are crowded out by the 30 million acres of corn that's being planted to support the ethanol industry. We need to be honest about the fact that it has an implication when we set up barriers like a tariff. We get countries around the world to do the same thing. Fewer global exchanges of goods and services, agricultural products, means higher prices for everyone in the world of all of those products, whether they're corn related or not. Let's talk about the, the impact. People say, well, it's really a small impact. It's only a few percent. This is a dramatic <clears throat> chart. <clears throat> the red bars show the percentage of corn in America that's being diverted from food to ethanol. A third this year. That's, that's the, the far end. 2008 will be 33% of our corn in America diverted to ethanol. Uh, I, I don't, and I don't think it's suddenly going to drop off in 2009 or 2010. As the mandate goes from 7 billion gallons to 10 billion gallons, making sure I'm holding the chart correctly, <laughs> to, to 36 billion gallons in the out years. So that's only going to create more pressure on prices, more crowding out on land. It's just hard to argue with the striking nature of that graph. So let's talk about these impacts specifically. Economic impacts. When you're diverting a third of the crop to ethanol, it has a real impact on prices. To produce a gallon of ethanol takes 1,700 gallons of water. 30 million acres of land going to support the corn for ethanol and, of course, all the associated labor. Those are economic inputs that could otherwise go to producing other food crops, other products, other services in a much more efficient way that doesn't depend on billion dollars a year in subsidy. The environmental impact. A lot of the justification early on was made that this was good for the environment. The most recent evaluations of the environmental impact, however, is quite different. 1,700 gallons of water to produce a gallon of ethanol, we ought to be honest about the environmental impact of that in an age of scarcer water resources. But a recent study published in Science says that corn-based ethanol nearly doubles greenhouse gas emissions from that land that's cultivated over a 30-year period. Significant environmental consequences. And finally, the moral implications in a global crisis, global food crisis, 
where we have terrible economic policies in places like Venezuela and Zimbabwe, creating local shortages, terrible military consequences of the fighting in Darfur, creating terrible local consequences. We need the most efficient, fair production and distribution of food today than we've ever had before. But unfortunately, we don't because we have a 54 cent a gallon tax on imported ethanol. We have a 51 cent per gallon credit for ethanol, and we have a mandate of billions and billions of gallons per year. There's no, no product in the country where we mandate that consumers buy it and give the producers a tax credit. That is outrageous. And if it were any other product or service that we required consumers to buy and then gave the producers a tax credit, people would be taken to the streets because they would immediately see the injustice. But this has been papered over because of the vehicle that these subsidies move in, papered over because I think a lot of misleading information was given about the environmental consequences and papered over because we didn't really have to suffer the price of the checkout counter until the last couple of years till these policies have really come home to roost. I think we, there hasn't been enough candid discussion about this. Frankly, there's been a little bit too much sort of vague talk about all the different areas of production that might come in the future from non-food so sources. And I think that is an area of promise, whether it's from uh, sustainable biomass, uh, switchgrass, non-agricultural areas, municipal waste. I mean, these are areas where product is lying, not being used, area land that's not being cultivated, that have a lot more promise and would do a lot less damage to our economy, to our environment, and to the global food shortage if we pursued those areas. But uh, the ethanol, uh, the corn-based ethanol subsidies have been a, a disaster for our economy. They've been a disaster for our environment, and today consumers are realizing they're a disaster for their pocketbook all over the country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Sununu. Senator Coburn. Great question. <clears throat> um, I think I was very candid. <clears throat> you were. I, at, the, at the top. You were. I, I wanted it. to take the time to make it. a few Hey, I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah, you know, I might, I just want, this seems very relevant with a main baker here, that the son of the main baker, who used to be our colleague in the Senate, Bill Cohen, had a knack that I noticed after a year or so here, that when he had a five-minute round of questions, he would make a four minute and 45 second opening statement, then ask his question, and the answer would go on for, you know, five or <laughs> 10 minutes. <laughs> well, hopefully I won't do that. Okay. <clears throat> I apologize for missing some of your testimonies. <clears throat> I'd like for each of you, to, first of all, let me make a statement and ask if it's a correct statement. The price of wheat right now really is not in this mix based on corn-based ethanol. Basically, we had crop failures in Ukraine, South America and Australia that really drove up the price of wheat. Is that not correct? That, that's largely correct. There's that's been the, some that, contribution from yeah, biofuels. The, the, but the vast it, majority but, of the yeah. increase in the price of wheat has nothing to do with ethanol. <clears throat> don't, don't get confused. I'm not a supporter of ethanol. Uh, but I think it's important for us to characterize because, first of all, oftentimes, like in central Oklahoma, it's not corn land. You can't use the land for corn. So we're not seeing that at wheat, and, and wheat has moderated considerably since we saw the spikes. It's also interesting to note that wheat reserves in this country are the lowest level they've been in 40 years. Uh, so that's the other reason why we saw an increase. My question for you is this. Uh, according to my reading, at $65 a barrel oil, there is a break-even on ethanol without a subsidy. Is that correct or not correct? In other words, if you have $65 oil manifested to $2 and about 50 cent gallon gasoline, does that not in fact neutralize? In other words, there's no need for a, a subsidy for blending ethanol. Let me ask you a different way. At what price of oil is there no longer a need to subsidize the blending of ethanol? Well, I'll answer that. Um, it, uh, given the existence of, of about 11 billion gallons of plant capacity that we're going to have, um, there is a, a direct relationship between the price of crude oil and the quantity of ethanol you want. So if you want a lot of 
ethanol, you're going to have to subsidize it for a given price of oil. But there is a quantity of ethanol at $65 crude that would probably be in the neighborhood of seven to eight billion gallons. All right. Well, but you're taking that completely out of any economic model. Let's say we have a real economic model and no subsidy. At what price of oil will you have people producing ethanol? Uh, you'll have, it depends on the cost of corn. It is an economic model. The price of corn is linked to the price of crude. You cannot have a price of corn that is low and a price of crude that is high. If you had that kind of situation, all the ethanol plants would turn on, the price of corn would just jump right back up. So why do we need this, the, the incentive? Um, my testimony here is if you got rid of all the incentives that it would not have very much impact on the total quantity of ethanol relative to what we're producing now. So, so one of my economic primers is greed conquers all technologic difficulty is, is not necessarily true. Is it, with, with oil at $122 a barrel yesterday, if we had a floor price out there so that ethanol producers could see that we were, we'll have a minimum floor price on the price of oil, would we not get the same investment based on an economic model if they knew there was a fixed bottom price to the price of oil? I'll let either of you answer. Anybody want to answer if they want. Well, I'll, I'll just make a short <coughs> answer. Um, I, I think, frankly, that uh, at today's crude oil prices, you get rid of all the incentives for ethanol, we're going to grow out to the projected volume of about 14 billion gallons of plant capacity, even if you got rid of the incentives today. It just makes sense over time. It makes economic sense. It makes economic There's sense. There's money goes to the bottom line without it. And that's an important point. Uh, so in terms of policy, is it good economic policy to charge poor people taxes to incentivize ethanol production, and the result of that is the cost of their food goes through the roof? Certainly not from an international perspective where in, 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 my, in my work I, I'm worried about poor people overseas as well and it, obviously that is not a good policy for them. Actually what we have is a real inequity in this country today yeah. because what we're doing is going to take 13 to 15 billion dollars worth of the taxpayers' money and incentivize something that otherwise economically would produce with the price of oil where it is. And then, not only are they going to pay the tax for it, they're going to have an increased cost of living. And these are the people with the smallest marginal disposable income. So what we've really done is we've shifted money away from the poorest to help the, the wealthiest. It, it is an absolute arcane policy that's directly opposite of what we should be about doing in this country to raise everybody up. Um, are you all aware of some of the shenanigans that are going on today where somebody imports biodiesel into a southern port, blends a gallon of real diesel with it, collects the dollar tax credit, and then sells it in Europe because they get a dollar more a gallon for the biodiesel than they do here? Are you all aware of that happening? Would you comment on that at all uh, from an economic model? In other words, it, did we not create this, the incentive the proper way so that it's not going to be gained? What do we do to fix that? Well, one way is to take away all subsidies for biofuels. That would, that would, that would do it. Um, the EU is trying to negotiate something less radical than that. Uh, I think the biodiesel producers in the U.S. would rather go see the EU way. But um, clearly, if you took away the dollar a gallon um, uh, blender's credit, that kind of shenanigan would go away. All right. Is anybody opposed to taking away the dollar a gallon blender's credit for biodiesel? No. Does anybody think it would have a negative impact on future production of biodiesel? Uh, I'll, I'll speculate that the dollar a gallon um, um, credit is not enough to keep biodiesel plants running right now given the high vegetable oil prices. Um, and it's really, they're going to rely on that mandated use that starts kicking in in 2009. Okay. All right. I have no further questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks uh, uh, very much, Senator Coburn. Uh, l l let's do another uh, six-minute round. Um, Dr. Backpack, I want to come back to your, your uh, research. Incident, I really appreciate that you and Dr. Rosegrant have, have presented to us some uh, quite relevant current estimates of the impact of uh, uh, various policies. Um, of the three policies now supporting ethanol, um, I, I, I wanted to ask you 
uh, maybe I missed it earlier on, what's your estimated impact of the tariff on imported ethanol alone? In other words, if we remove the tariff, what, what would be the percentage reduction uh, in the price of the commodity? Um, it, it would have very little impact because um, we would get a lot more imports into the United States, but still that doesn't, wouldn't, we would, we would more than double our imports of ethanol into the United States, but, the but in the next year or two, the supply of ethanol that's exportable by Brazil, would, they would, we would run out. We would, we would uh, take all their exportable surplus, would bring it into the United States, and it would have some impact on the domestic production because we would use, we would essentially be subsidizing the Brazilian import of ethanol because they would qualify for the 51 cent uh -huh. a gallon blenders credit. Gotcha. So we would just be sucking the ethanol out of Brazil and it would also help meet our mandate. And so, but, so it would have modest effects though in terms of the price of corn and, and uh, it would have a bigger effect on the quantity of ethanol produced in the United States, but we'd still have that 51 cent a gallon blenders credit. So is, is that the big one of the three? Or, or do they really, it's all of them and the way they work together. It's it's all in how they work together. So if you were going to, you know, does it really make a lot of sense to subsidize Brazilian ethanol production and no. bring it into the United States? It doesn't to me. It would. So I I look at these policies as as working together, and so just taking one of them off doesn't do perhaps what you think it might. Yeah. Okay, uh, Dr. Rosegrant, let, let me. Um, because I know you focus on the international aspects of this. Um, am, am I right that um, Europe has, as it's tried to diversify its uh, energy supply, has uh, focused on biofuels? Is that correct? Yeah, and, and particularly biodiesel. Yes. Biodiesel, yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, as we said, Brazil um, has done really very well with sugar-based ethanol, and so far in the U.S. we're talking about corn-based uh, ethanol. Um, can, can you evaluate uh, the impact that these three different approaches to the fuel, alternative fuel uh, challenge policy have had on food prices? Is it I think you understand my question. Yeah, well, well, again, looking, what we did was look at the, essentially the combination rather than, than right. parsing them out separately. And as, as we said, we did try to look at the historical impact from 2000 to 2007. And that if taking, if we look particularly at the grains, which we were looking at is because they're some such important staple foods, if you did an av uh, sort of a, a weight, production weighted average, then, then biofuel, the increases in biofuel since 2000 have caused about 30 percent of the increase in, in food in grain prices up through 2007. That doesn't include this uh, sort of policy driven spike of, of the last four months. But if it has had a more, bigger impact on corn where we, we project it's, it contributed to nearly 40 percent of the increase but only only about 20 percent of the increase for rice and, and wheat. Um, is it appropriate, uh, constructive, uh, for there to be more international cooperation in uh, the adoption of these um, of, uh, sort of commodity-based fuel alternatives? Is any of that happening now? If it did, yeah. how, how, and I'll bring you in on this, Reverend uh, Beckman, how, what's, what's the institutional way in which that could happen? Yeah, very little has been done on that, partly because the uh, different countries have pursued their, in a sense, highly subsidized or protected developments of, the, of their own markets. And, right. and in fact, I think one thing that should happen if, in fact, for example, there was a, a phase out in, of some of the subsidies uh, uh, for in the U.S. one would be that there should be a multilateral uh, negotiation to have transparent markets in, in uh, uh, crop-based uh, uh, eth ethanol and, and diesel products that has not happened yet and try to you know establish essentially a, a proper international commodity market in biofuels but, but one that is not driven by the individual uh, distortions in, yeah. in different countries. Is there an existing, uh, I'm not an expert in this area, is there an existing institutional framework through which that could happen? I don't believe there's anything other than if you would work through existing commodity exchanges to try to develop that, but there's nothing specific for these that I'm aware of unless uh, the others know. Yeah, I mean, the point here obviously is that these, these are now, like everything else, global markets, so what we do here has an impact there, what they do there has an impact 
here and uh, everywhere. So uh, uh, that, that was the question. Reverend Beckman, do you have a thought on this? Well, part of it could be uh, the consultative group on international agricultural research, the whole network of uh, research institutes, ag research institutes in developing countries. I don't know that they're doing anything on it, but it makes a lot of sense. There is a demand here. And uh, it could be that things that uh, Africa is producing that now have no economic value could have some econom economic value. So um, that would be part of the, um, to do that, you need to, uh, last year, um, I think almost inadvertently, the foreign aid appropriations dramatically dropped uh, AID funding for agriculture and right. including contributions to the agricultural research network. So um, investing in ag research is one way to handle this. Also, it seems to me it is the broader question of if, if what we're trying to do here with biofuels is to deal with uh, higher oil prices and uh, the negative effects of reliance on fossil fuels, you know, sharing information on how to conserve complete other ways, other kinds of alternative fuels besides agriculturally based uh, agriculturally based sources of energy. I mean, we're not doing very much on on wind or solar or all the other possibilities. So I don't know of any international research. It's good. It's a really good point. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll pursue that. Senator Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Babcock, Mr. Siegel mentioned in his testimony the role of speculation in the commodity markets. And as the chairman has indicated, uh, we are going to look at that issue in a subsequent hearing. When I look at the price increases in the futures markets, they seem to have reacted very sharply to the 2007 energy bill that included the increase in the renewable fuel standard. Would you agree that there was a correlation there? Is that something you've looked at? There was a very strong correlation um, between, uh, uh, first of all, it was in the price of corn. And then, because the future price of corn went up, everyone knew the price of soybeans had to follow, so then soybeans went up right afterwards. I, I'm not saying it's causal, but it, it happened. It's a very strong coincidence if it wasn't causal. It uh, leads me to wonder if we revise the three ethanol policies, whether there would be a similar reaction in the futures market where you might see a decline in commodity prices beyond what your model showed. Could you comment on that issue? Um, yeah, it, it's very difficult to figure that out because um, uh, you really have to look at two, three years down the road. And and uh, be, but since that time occurred, you got to remember also that the value of the dollar was falling at that time. Price of oil was skyrocketing at that time, and and everything was leading at, at the same time as the biofuels uh, uh, the energy act was passed they were all pushing the price of corn higher at that at, at that time but there is the possibility that if congress made a strong statement by eliminating um, all su support for the uh, corn ethanol industry and said you're on your own um, I, there would probably be an initial reaction that would be larger than what I'm estimating. But I'm saying that after, though, everything settled down and people looked at the fundamental economics of corn ethanol and the plants that are being built and the price of oil, that, you know, my estimates are probably somewhere in the ballpark. Mr. Beckman, do you have any comment on the impact on the futures markets in this area? I know that's not an area you've no. looked at directly. That's but not I in the Bible. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Dr. Rose Grant. No, I mean, I would essentially agree with, uh, with what you've said, and uh, what Dr. Babcock said that I think there could be a larger impact on futures markets than you would see in the fundamental spot, uh, spot markets. So it, it would try to sort of wring out some of the excesses that you're seeing in, in, in market prices right now. 
I think that's an important point given what happened when the mandate was put in place. It seemed to cause an immediate and sharp increase in prices on the futures markets. It seems that if the mandates were reduced, that you would see a similar impact in the opposite direction. I do want to make clear that I realize that the infrastructure that has grown up in Iowa and other states to support the corn-based ethanol industry is significant and, as Reverend Beckman pointed out, has had an impact on rural communities in a positive way. Um, so we do have to be careful as we adjust our policy in this area because people relied on those policies. But I do think we're in a different situation today because the high price of oil makes the, the rationale for all these subsidies and mandates far less compelling. Uh, Reverend Beckman, the EPA has the authority right now to adjust the renewable fuel, fuel standard mandate if there are unintended effects, that's what the standard is in, in the law. Do you think we as members of Congress should ask the EPA to reevaluate the level of the mandate? That makes sense to me um, because I don't think anybody, when Congress made this decision, these decisions, I don't think anybody expected food prices to jump like they have. Nobody expected to see uh, 100 million people suffering severe consequences in developing countries. It has a political dimension. There is a security dimension to this with a lot of governments feeling very threatened and the international discussion of this issue, um, the people who speak for developing countries, they see that this is, this is one factor that somebody made a decision and it's resulted in severe hardship in their, their their cities and threatens the political stability of their country. So in the international discussion of this, there's, there's considerable, you know, they point to the corn-based, the, the, the connection that you point out between corn-based ethanol and the sudden, sudden jump. So clearly circumstances have changed and I didn't know if EPA has that authority, they ought to use it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you again for holding this very important hearing. I think this is an example, perhaps the best example I've ever seen of the law of unintended consequences. All of us want to reduce our dependence on foreign oil, which I believe poses a threat to our economic and our national security. But in doing so, in rushing to embrace the use of food for fuel, my concern is that we have exacerbated uh, the problem of hunger worldwide, that we're causing difficulties for small businesses such as Mr. Siegel's bakery, and the policy has had also consequences for low-income families right here in our country at a time when they're struggling with the high cost of energy. So I believe that we need to take a hard look at this, at this policy and what appears to me to be a factor that is contributing to the high costs of food and a factor that we can control. And that's the important point to me. We can do nothing about drought in Australia. There is so much that is beyond our control. Uh, but this is a factor that we can control. And I'm very grateful to the chairman for probing this issue. I hope you'll all continue to help us find the path forward in this area. And I very much appreciated the testimony of each of you today. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Collins, uh, again, for inspiring the hearing. Uh, and uh, I agree with uh, what you've said just now. Um, the other point, the other lesson I think we learned here is that we, we, we saw the problem of dependence on uh, foreign fossil fuel and all the impacts it has on our economy, our environment, our security. But we, we, we by our own action, well intended, uh, sent a disproportionate set of subsidies to one 
um, one form of alternative fuel. Uh, presumably, if we had passed a, a, a comprehensive program that sent a lot of signals to a lot of different, uh, uh, including cellulosic and uh, uh, biodiesel and electric cars and all the rest, hy you know, hydrogen fuel cells, w I, I'm not. I understand that they don't wouldn't all come online at once, but at, at least the impact would have been reduced, and we didn't do that. Hopefully we'll have a chance, an opportunity to do something like that soon. But yeah, the other point that strikes me here is that none, none of you have said that the, um, that, that the policies we adopted uh, with regard to support and incenting uh, corn-based ethanol are the only cause of food price increases. Obviously, there, there are others, including this does come into your biblical area of expertise, uh, natural phenomena like drought. <laughs> I was thinking of Joseph, who you know stored yeah. up the grain for seven years, but that's a, a longer story. Um, but I, I'm struck after your testimony this, this morning, I'm, I'm bail, building on the point that there are more than one cause of the, of the global food price increase and food crisis, but that it may be that the most significant positive impact we in Congress can have in the short run on food prices is to remove uh, these three incentives for corn-based ethanol. Um, your, your testimony has been very, um, very helpful, and I appreciate it uh, uh, very much. We're going to leave the uh, record of this hearing open for uh, 15 days in case members of the committee have additional questions they'd like to submit to you in writing or uh, you have additional testimony you would want to submit for the final transcript of the hearing. But um, I thank you for the work that each of you does and the service that you've given in your testimony uh, this morning. It was extremely helpful. The hearing is adjourned. <laughs>